So I'm excited to introduce uh, Frank Duff and have him talk about the MITRE's attack platform because I've just begun using it in my own work. And what I find so interesting about it is that it gives us a standardized taxonomy that we can use to, to discuss tactics, to discuss techniques, to discuss very specific issues that we have or to generalize them um, for, for non-tech people. And it's, it's the first common language, I think, that we've had in, in, um, in our community. And I, I expect um, as we begin to use it more and more, it's going to become even more useful to us. So please welcome Frank Duff from the MITRE Corporation. Yeah. So, so thank you guys very much. I'm going to try to, to stay on track here. Love the topic, love attack, lots of directions to go, try to keep it focused. Um, but to begin, do have to give a little bit of a primer of what is attack. And at least in the terms of this evaluation presentation here and where we're going to talk about the methodology, uh, we want to focus on the fact that it is community driven, it is open, it is free, and it's really trying just to define the threat. Um, as Mel pointed out, right, it's about being able to describe adversary acti activity in a common language. Um, and we utilize that uh, very effectively. Um, so feel free to contribute to the attack framework uh, at uh, attack at miter.org, um, email, always considering contributions. So why do we use attack for evaluations? And this is one of those classic views, doesn't matter so much what is on the screen as much as what it represents. So this is the stoplight chart that's very famous um, for, for attack, is one of the common adoptions. And I think that's a good place to start the story of how we got to where we are with the MITRE attack evaluations. So think back five years ago when MITRE's doing research into how to find the adversary post-exploit. Uh, we're running a number of cyber games in our environments trying to understand how to detect more effectively. We needed a common language to be able to have our red team communicate to our blue team. We needed them to be able to describe what they were doing in a common way that would remove the, the focus of IOCs such that our blue team could understand how to detect more effectively. Similarly, we had to communicate the, the purpose, the benefits of doing these types of tests, the improvement that we're making to our management. And that's really where evaluating with attack came into play and where the attack framework came from. So a few things to remember about attack. It is threat informed, which makes it great for testing, right? You're not anymore dealing with what could be, you're dealing with what is. And so you're refocusing the detection on making actual improvements to your products. Secondly, easy visualization. In this example, you have green, which you could detect, or red, that's a miss, or yellow, that's a partial. Um, it allows you to show incremental improvements, right? If, you, if I do the same evaluation multiple times, right, you can see yellows turning to green. You can see the reds turning to yellows. You can see that, that gradual improvement and fill out the, the attack matrix more and more. Finally, it is that common language that everybody can understand because it's at an abstraction level that talks about the high level goals in the terms of tactics as well as how those goals are achieved through the techniques. Um, so that common language is very powerful. And that's why we've continued to extend it into doing uh, attack evaluations. So this is just the high level description of what we're going and then we'll go deep into actually the methodology and that's where the focus of the talk will be today. So the attack evaluations website launched back in November. Uh, we released the methodology. Again, that's going to be the focus here. As well as the first seven vendors that participated in our evaluations. Um, unlike the previous talk, the vendors in this case are actually paying to get evaluated. It's purely up to them whether they want to or not. Um, but they pay and we perform their evaluation. Uh, but we keep it so that it's open, right? There's no opt out. They can't hide away the results or anything like that. You sign up, you know what you're getting. You're getting this evaluated. You're getting it in terms of MITRE's attack framework and you're having to uh, public release results. And the hope there is that we can be much more open about uh, describing what these tools can do well and what they can't do well. Uh, just as uh, uh, Mudge was pointing out, right? We want to be data driven. We don't want just um, any old vendor to say any old thing about their product. We want to be able to know what they're saying is true and that's really what we're trying to achieve here. The way we line up our evaluations, we split them into rounds where each round is focused on a specific adversary. So we use an inspired by technique um, for adversary emulation, right? So that doesn't mean we're using their tool sets. It doesn't mean that we're using their specific way of implementing bypass UAC. We're using representatives of those so that we can mimic a behavior based on the threat, but up again at the attack level. So round one, APT3 emulation. Round two, hopefully we're going to be able to announce uh, very soon here, uh, but, but still to come. 
the initial testing is focused purely on the detection uh, capabilities. So that, therefore, we kind of hit the EDR market or the endpoint detect and respond market and the EPP market's pretty hard. Um, and, and as you can see by the list of the vendors contributing, right, we've had some of the biggest names in the industry already participate. So now let's actually talk about some of the good technical content uh, rather than the, the, those few overview slides to set the stage. So our evaluation process should be nothing surprising for anybody that's done evaluation any time in their life, right? I mean, we've got a setup of an execution, processing, and releasing results. Go figure. But let me talk about a few of the unique components of this. And so setup is one of those things that um, really helped us define ourselves from a scientific methodo methodological approach. Um, when we originally went out, right, we, we had the, these grand visions of being able to have uh, um, um, at, uh, an environment that looked like a real environment, that had noise that looked like real noise, being able to do things like measuring false positives and things like that, very quickly we realized all that was not going to happen, right? We have to be able to first get ground truth on these products before we can deal with the, the much more challenging dimensions of evaluating um, a, a, a capability. So what we did was we provided five node networks, right? It's just enough so that we can emulate our behaviors as we need to. It's not supposed to be a representative of any organization. It's just supposed to be these are base Windows images. Deploy these tools and let's get ground truth. We're not measuring how hardened Windows is or anything like that. We're measuring the tools themselves. And so we keep it really simple. Um, we provide the access to the range, but the vendor installs and configures the tool. And so the reason why we really do that is because we don't want to be experts. We can't be experts in all these tools. We don't want to be the cause since all these results are getting public release, we don't want to be the cause of these vendors looking poor. So what we do is we say, you know your tool, install it and configure it. You can configure it however you want. And of course the first thing that comes up in every conversation with every vendor is, well what are you going to do with my competitor that's going to dial their, their sensitivities up and just generate a ton of false positives. And I mean, it is what it is, but by making a vendor describe what their, or how they're configuring their tool, by being open about what that configuration is, we're making it so that um, if they do dial it up, the consumers can make the decision of does that dialing up make sense for their organization or not. So execution, I'm going to go heavy in on the next slide. Um, so right now, I'll just keep it simple. At MITRE provides the white teams and the red teams, right? So we're providing the oversight, the ones that are saying this is a detection, this is not a detection, and we're providing the assessors. The vendor is the one that's providing the blue team. Again, we can't possibly become experts in even the, the seven or or nine tools that we've evaluated. So let the vendor who knows their product best come in and be the blue team and the defender and tell us what the detection is. Processing of results, this is really the painful process. MITRE provides the initial assessment. Um, this is a, another one of the slides that will go into more detail later, but MITRE provides the initial assessment of what we think these detections relate to um, and the vendors able to provide feedback, right? We give them questions of, hey, we think we should have saw this, we didn't get a screenshot, can you provide one to us? It's not supposed to be just we're coming down from an ivory tower saying, hey, these are the results, but we're saying, this is what our interpretation is, what do you guys think? And of course, they have to provide us enough proof that we, at the end of the day, can be the, the, the independent body that's doing the validation and the publishing of the results. But in every step of this, this process, the vendor is participating. Um, up until that final publication. And I think that's one of the neat dimensions about the, the evaluations that we're doing and a little bit different is the fact that the vendor is so involved with us um, in every step of the way. So the execution itself. Day one is set up for Cobalt Strike. Day two is set up for Empire. Um, I'll, so we run through, and I'll just go forward here. So we run through an end-to-end -end post exploitation um, of, of the, the adversary behavior. So it's supposed to be a realistic thing, right? We hit all the attack tactics um, after that initial access component, all the way down to being able to exfil data off. And then we execute the persistence is just to show that we can't, that, that long term aspect of the engagement. But this is obviously very condensed, but it allows us to see each of the techniques, test each of the techniques in both an atomic way because we treat each step independently, but in the context of an entire engagement by stringing them along together. Consistency and repeatability are very co important components of this and I'd say one of the things that we value above everything from our evaluation methodology. We want the same environment as I already talked to, we want the same attack path, it's literally a copy and paste for the red team 
once it's created, it's a lot of work to get there, but once it's created, it's a copy and paste for the red team to be able to execute these evaluations. That means that we're using the same hosts in every environment, we're using the same users in every environment. The only difference is each vendor gets their own. Other than that, the methodology itself is, is set in stone. As I mentioned in the previous slide, the vendor um, uh, contributions, participations, that's really what it comes down to, right? So it, you might have heard Miter do other talks at ZeefCon or a number of other different places talking about purple teaming and adversary emulation, and those are core components of how we do evaluations as well. We put the red and blue team in the same room. Um, we're open book. We're going to tell you exactly what we do as evaluators, and we're asking you as the blue team to be able to tell us what, what we did, show us what we did. Is that the right thing? Is that not the right thing? So what this allows is us to provide immediate benefits to the vendor, right? We're showing them uh, potential flaws in their capabilities. We've identified in some cases actual problems with their operational deployments. We've been able to identify things that they could um, improve in their products in terms of usability, in terms of the user interface. We've been able to, to just inf uh, um, reinforce some of the decision choices that they're going to make but they're able to have their UI up on the screen, right? They're showing us what they're detecting as they're detecting it, and we're able to say, no, that's really just a, 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 a attribute of Cobalt Strike running, or that's just an attribute of Empire running. What we're really looking for is X, or what we're really looking for is Y. Um, and in some cases, we don't know, but, and the vendor's able to tell us, and that's great, um, but in other cases, we're able to help them kind of figure out what is an appropriate attack detection. And so, by being in the same room, being in open communication, not hiding the fact of what we're doing, we're able to get to that level of detail much quicker and make sure that uh, the vendor community is advancing as best as it can. And finally, the, the point that I was going to make about the day one, day two, um, using multiple tools. One of the challenges with attack um, is, is that when you look at a stoplight chart at least, you, you lose the granularity of how those tools or how the red team tools are actually being used to accomplish that technique, right? You lose the procedure aspect when you look at a stoplight chart. So we want to be able to execute things in a couple different ways to start trying to pressure some of these tools to see where that line is. How far can they, they detect? So can they do command line? I would hope at this point every EDR solution can do command line. PowerShell, again, hopefully every tool can do PowerShell at least to some degree right now. API that's something that's, that's much harder to detect, right? There's a lot more data there. So that's where the vendors start trailing off. But being able to show that there's those limits and show some variation in how we're executing is an important part when you're considering attack testing because oftentimes people just want to color in the square for that technique saying, hey, that was a hit. But that's the wrong way of looking at it. You have to test it in a few different ways. So now let's talk about the actual what we did for the results portion. Um, and so, again, Looking at it from where we came from, we thought that, that the stoplight matrix might be a great idea. Um, fortunately, we were able to, to catch on that there was going to be some limitations early on. Um, so I've already hit on one of those. You don't see the technique variation. It's two, right? I mean, you could imagine saying, okay, green, you detected all the procedures. Or red, you didn't detect any procedures. And yellow, maybe you detected some of the ways that we implemented it. Well, high level, sure. But you lose the granularity of well, how did they detect it, right? Were they able just to get the telemetry and see that that event happened, or were they actually able to alert on it? But then, what about an alert for credential dumping versus an alert for uh, process discovery, right? I mean, those, those are two very different things. Credential dumping makes it sense to have an alert. Process discovery and things like that don't. So you can't just, just, just look at this in the, the super abstract form. Even in the case of an alert fired for Mimi Cats dumping credentials, that's okay. But was it triggering on Mimi Cats or was it uh, triggering on accessing LSAS, right? So there's just too much information that needs to exist in the stoplight chart. So we went away with that. And we came up with, um, uh, well, delay. All right. So we came up with uh, uh, a slightly different way, right? So everybody loves the matrix. We love the matrix still. But we enabled it so that it would be a little bit more interactive experience. So you can roll over, you can see some details about the detections. We try to keep it relatively high level um, in this view, um, but you can roll over, you can see the types of detections, and I'll get into that on the next slide, um, as well as some uh, of the procedure notes so you know how we actually implemented it in the test. 
Um, but it's the high level. And then you kind of go deep into any of the tech tactics, you can go into any of the techniques, and this is an overview slide. But what we try to show here, again, what matters is less about the actual content versus the high level understanding of it. But what you see is uh, a number of details that we think are absolutely critical to actually explain detections for these tools. So in terms of detection categories, that's the abstract level, right? So we started on the, the spectrum of stoplight charts, then switch over to the spectrum of detection notes. Great for somebody that actually is just really specific on that tool. So like a, a, a end game user looking at the end game notes, for instance, that works great. But if you're trying to look across products, it means nothing, right? You don't know the terminology of all these different tools and how all those pros work. So we wanted to create some abstract middle ground between, similar to how attacks are used to describe adversary behavior, we wanted some middle ground to describe the detections. And that's really where we create um, a number of categories to be able to describe the different types of detections. This is a really difficult process to go through and the main reason why it takes so long for us to get the results out because we need to make sure that we're being consistent in terms of how we're applying these categories, removing vendorism, so is a vendor the way that they describe an alert, is that really the right type of alert or not? So it, it's a very challenging process, uh, but, but one of those things we felt is absolutely necessary if you're gonna start making the results usable and looking across products. I will do a plug in saying that I think that these detection categories are, are subject to change and, and evolution, um, one of the probably biggest places where we're gonna have to continue to evolve to make the results more usable. If you've got feedback, feel free to, to, to email a team and the contact information's at the end of the slides. Um, we have the notes still, so that's the, the, the painstaking details. We have the screenshots, those are used as proof of detection. And we include in there the procedures, because again, I think a lot of this comes down to not just I was able to detect an attack technique, I was able to detect an attack technique that was executed in this way. And that's a main component for this. So, meaningful output. Output. Um, so I was originally going to do a meaningful question mark out output because I think uh, if, if anybody's been looking at any of the results, it's really kind of interesting to see every vendor says that they won. Um, we didn't do a score, we didn't do a ranking. All we wanted to do was be able to say that this is how each tool does it. And I think the fact that every vendor has said that they are the best at whatever is actually kind of echoing that sentiment, right? Different vendors take different approaches. Different industries have different use or different uh, uh, companies, different industries have different needs. Each of these vendors might be true in what they're saying in terms of, hey, this is a great thing. This is a great thing. I'm the best. Um, so I think in different use cases, each of these vendors are special and that's what really, why at the core we didn't include a ranking, why we didn't include a rating because it requires so much more input. But at the end of the day, the important thing is, is that the vendor capabilities are getting a lot better. We're able to show the vendors directly during the evaluation how they can improve. We're able to show industry that if, let's say you're a user of CrowdStrike, how can CrowdStrike help you? We show you how you can use CrowdStrike to do these attack detections. We allow you to be empowered with, again, as much was saying, the data, right? We're providing a baseline data for you to build upon. Um, and so you can take this, you can then take our methodology, deploy these solutions in your environment, repeat the test, and that's where you can really start driving home some of those needs in terms of, um, what your false positives look like. Is PowerShell a reasonable alert for you or is it not a really reasonable alert for you? You can start getting to some of those things that actually are very specific to each organization and can't just be generalized with a basic evaluation. So we want to be that baseline and that, that way people can build off of it um, and become more informed. So with that, um, we've, we're hitting the, the end here. I uh, wanted to do a few plugs. Make sure you uh, look at the, the Medium um, attack blog. We're going to be releasing a number of uh, pieces of content related to evals um, in terms of how the, the community can help us uh, improve as well as some explanations and how we're, we're uh, uh, framing detections um, and, and a number of other topics. Um, so follow that, um, feel free to reach out if you've got any comments, questions about how to use or how you're using. Very interested in getting feedback so we can continue to evolve. Um, but hopefully you, you've looked at it, hopefully you know that it's more than just the results and it's also about the methodology, it's also about being able to utilize this methodology to improve your organization's uh, defenses as well. Um, and so with that, I think I'm out of time. I'll be out there if you have any questions, but I think I'm, I'm there. <laughs>